So the last uh, talk for this session is Publicity Circuits That Know What They Don't Know by Fabrizio Ventola, Stephen Brown, Zonji Yu, and Martin Mann, and Christian Kersting. And the speaker is Fabrizio Ventola. Yeah. Hi. Okay. So most of the machine learning research focuses on a closed world setting where the data to train and evaluate the model originates from the same distribution. Such focus overlooks uh, crucial requirements for uh, real world inference scenarios where the model is confronted with auto distribution data, conceptually novel samples, or unfiltered corrupt inputs. Unfortunately, many machine learning models are overconfident in these challenging situations, and they assign high probabilities to wrong predictions or to instances with unseen categories. Um, in short, uh, on average, they provide um, higher confidence than, than accuracy. To get the gist of these uh, challenging scenarios, um, here you can see on the left this image of uh, simple corruptions that one model can encounter uh, during inference in the real world. As been shown that um, uh, prominent uh, neural discriminators that have, have achieved uh, superhuman uh, accuracy in closed setting, when confronted with such corruptions, they easily drop their performance to be uh, subhuman and they also still uh, provide high confidence. So this is problematic because um, the, mo the models transmit high confidence when they shouldn't, and this could mislead users that instead should take this prediction with care. This issue uh, does not impact only uh, purely discriminative models like support vector machines, but also major deep generative models like variational autoencoders and normalizing flows. So these models in particular have been shown that they tend to uh, assign even higher uh, likelihood to auto-distribution data compared to the in-distribution samples. And this again is, is problematic because a likelihood is often used as a score to discriminate between in-distribution and auto-distribution samples or to detect uh, different kinds of outliers. So uh, intuitively speaking, these models don't know what they don't know. A fairly new family of tractable probabilistic models called probabilistic circuits are assumed to overcome this challenge in literature, and they are casted as well-calibrated models. In our work, we show that, similarly to the, their neural counterpart, probabilistic circuits suffer from overconfidence and struggle to distinguish from in-distribution and auto-distribution data in the discriminative setting. So in our experiment, uh, as you can see here, we train one PC, on a very popular uh, image data set of house numbers called SVHN. And then we evaluated the model on uh, other three uh, very popular image data set like CIFAR, LSUN. And as you can see, uh, the model assigns very similar predicting entropy to all the samples that come from this, this data set. So it's very hard to distinguish, to find the threshold to distinguish the in distributions uh, versus the out of distribution data. So um, a way to uh, tackle this challenge of overconfidence is to quantify the model uncertainty, since it can tell us how confident is the model in its predictions. Uh, however, this, uh, this operation is uh, quite expensive computationally. So um, also probabilistic circuits in their original form do not provide any form of uh, uncertainty in quantification. Therefore, in our work, we introduce a tractable inference method called tractable dropout inference, TDI, that provides both the prediction and a model uncertainty estimation in a tractable way. For TDI, we derive a simply free analytical solution for Monte Carlo dropout, MCD, that is a well-known Bayesian method for model uncertainty in neural networks that I will briefly explain later. And then with TDI, we demonstrate that it improves the PC's robustness against distribution shifts and auto distribution data in three key scenarios. So um, we focus on a prominent kind of probabilistic circuits called sum product networks, SPNs, that are well known for their inference capabilities and their representational power. Uh, similarly to neural networks, SPNs are deep graphs, but they uh, are 
tailored to probabilistic modeling, so they explicitly encode a normalized probability distribution. SPNs can generate new samples and answer a wide range of probabilistic queries in a tractable and exact way, even with partial evidence. So as you can see, uh, SPNs are deep computation graphs, similar to neural networks, but where we have essentially three kinds of nodes. So at least we have univariate distributions, usually parametric distribution, but we could also have uh, something more sophisticated as we have seen before, uh, like compact tractable probabilistic models like Cholu trees. Uh, at inner layers, we have two kinds of nodes. So some nodes and product nodes. And some nodes uh, to, to each some node, to each edge of a some node is associated uh, a non-negative uh, weight. And for each some node, the weights should sum up to one. And uh, SPNs have a very clear probabilistic semantics. So some node uh, represent um, a probabilistic weighted mixture model, while uh, product nodes represent a context specific factorizations. And so we can see an SPN as a deep hierarchical mixture model of different factorization. Depth is also important, similar to neural networks, because it enables the reuse of lower level components, so enhance the representational power of the model. Regarding inference, uh, we can compute the likelihood of an arbitrary uh, instance by running a bottom-up forward pass and then reading out the, the value, the quantity by the, from the root node. Uh, so it, it, it requires only an, a single pass for many of the probabilistic queries. For other probabilistic queries like MAP and MP, we need an additional top-down pass. Um, inference is generally linear in the network sides, and the networks are generally also very compact since are tree-like and very sparse. So it's usually very efficient to, to perform inference. I would like to remark that probabilistic modeling uh, indeed targets uncertainties, but it's crucial to quantify model uncertainty as well, uh, known as also as epistemic uncertainty, because can tell us how confident the model is in its prediction, including in the discriminative case uh, regarding the predictive distribution, the class label distribution. And unconfident models in this case assign near to one probabilities to auto distribution instances or to instances with unseen labels. In this case, in these challenging cases, model uncertainty can help us in knowing when the model doesn't know and when we need to take the prediction with caution. So a common Bayesian way to quantify model uncertainty in deep networks uh, involves choosing the most likely parameters configuration theta uh, that represent the best represent the data. But this approach is usually intractable as it involves integrating over the parameters theta. From the deep learning community, we know that dropout is a popular method to prevent overfitting and improve generalization by randomly removing connection between layers. So Gall and colleagues uh, in their ICML paper from 2016 reframed dropout as a Bayesian approximation for model uncertainty. So they place a Bernoulli distribution over the computation graph, over the weights, uh, basically uh, masking a binary mask. Uh, and in this way, they transform the intractable integration that we have seen before over parameters uh, with an approximated tractable sum over this set of weight, weight configurations. So with this weight configuration, with this n weight configuration, we can compute, we can evaluate even our model uh, with this several configuration and take uh, n different predictions. And with, with this sample, we can compute the first and the second row, so the mean and the variance, and that serve as a prediction and model uncertainty respectively. So we can also uh, apply Monte Carlo dropout in, uh, in probabilistic circuits very similarly um, in a similar fashion by placing a Bernoulli uh, distribution at some node weights. This is totally legit and the model is still valid so we don't break any nice structural property of SPN that allow to compute exact and tractable inference. Um, but still, to uh, compute the two row, uh, row moments, we need to uh, evaluate the model several times, and this is highly efficient. And now I uh, leave the stage to Simon that will show you how we can compute, uh, we can quantify the model uncertainty together with the prediction with PC in efficient uh, single forward pass. Hi. Okay, so MCD is cool, but um, can we do better? Um, so as Fabrizio just said, MCD needs n stochastic forward passes of the model, which we all can agree on is um, quite inefficient. 
Um, so MCD induces the uh, variance or the, the uncertainty by measuring the variance by um, multiple instantiations of the dropout. And if we do this in uh, PCs, this would be at some nodes. Um, now the question is, can we find a closed form solution for this uh, variance to obtain the uncertainty estimate in a single forward pass instead of like doing 100 forward passes? Um, and the answer is yes, um, we introduce tractable dropout inference. So the basic idea of tractable dropout inference is that we view node outputs as a function of its inputs and its dropout random variables. Um, then when we want to compute the uh, variance of the node, um, we decompose the um, variance into um, its input variances and some more terms. And then uh, what we need to do is to like compute this at the leaf um, of the of the graph and propagate the variances to the very top um, node to the root node. Uh, and with this TDI, um, so tractable dropout inference TDI only needs a single forward evaluation um, of the model, which is quite efficient uh, compared to MCD. Um, so um, like the graph we just saw earlier, instead of just propagating the likelihoods in the model, we now propagate the variances um, from bottom to top. Um, now, how do we find, uh, how do we make this tractable? To be tractable, we want closed form solutions. Um, so recall the, you see the pointer, yeah. Um, the sum nodes look like this. So we have a sum over the dropout random variables, the weights and the nodes. So the input nodes, um, the product nodes look like, um, it's just the product over the input um, nodes. And our goal now is to find a closed form solution for the variance of either some nodes or product nodes. I mean, both. Um, I won't go into the mathematical details here. It's just some uh, derivations. Um, important is that the variance now decomposes into a combination of input variances. So seen in blue here, um, input expectations and input covariances. So to actually compute this closed form solution for the variance, we also need closed form solutions for the um, for the expectations and for combinations of um, input covariances. Um, for the expectation, it's quite simple. So since the expectation is uh, linear, um, we can just move the expectation into the sum and also into the product. For the covariance, it gets more complicated. So for if we have two sum nodes, it's still easy. For two product nodes, again, I won't go into the details, but uh, you see this um, this orange term here. So we have the expectation over the product of the product of both um, of of all of the input nodes, and this is in general not decomposable because it can happen that there is a common um, input node deeper down in the graph. So these uh, input nodes are not. Um, independent in general. Um, but in the paper, we propose three solutions. Um, we can either make use of structural knowledge, for example, um, if we have learn SBN, so a structure learner um, for these graphs, um, they always output a tree-based graph where we know that there are, there's no common child uh, anymore deeper down in the graph. So the um, covariance then becomes zero at this point. Um, we can also make use of other like structural knowledge and in general, this just gives us additional independencies to then decompose the covariance uh, further. Um, alternatively, if we don't have any structural knowledge, we can make use of covariance bounds um, given by, for example, the cauchy schwarz inequality, um, which then uh, gives us the uh, a lower and an upper bound on the uh, covariance. Um, lastly, if we don't want to do this, we can uh, do something we call the copy-paste solution. Uh, which simply augments the graph. So if you have two nodes with a common child, we just copy the code and connect them separately. So with this, they become independent, the covariance goes to zero, and it's just another approximation. Um, what we haven't talked about yet is leaf nodes. Um, so in our current framework, we do not uh, use dropout in leaf nodes. So leaf nodes become a point estimate. Um, the expectation of the leaf node is still the leaf node output. The variance is zero, and the covariance between two leaf nodes uh, is also zero. But interestingly, so this actually allows us to now include prior knowledge about aleatoric or epistemic uncertainty by um, setting the, the variance of the leaf nodes larger than zero or the covariance between two leaf nodes um, not equal to zero. We, we haven't done this yet. This is for future work. Um, but know that, for example, in MCD, you can't do that because MCD is just, um, yeah, you evaluate this multiple times and just take the variance and the expectation over your results. Um, Okay, coming to our experiments, 
And um, this is the figure that Fabrizio already uh, showed in the beginning where we measure uh, where we train the model um, on the SVHN set, um, which is the in-domain set. And we evalu evaluate the percentage of outliers across multiple out-of-distribution thresholds um, against out-of-distribution sets. And now please, uh, Lisa and Yusuf, uh, do not like kill us because we use the predictive entropy here. Um, and what we see with normal PCs or standard PCs is that, I mean, we want the, the dashed um, red line to be very low over all thresholds and all the other lines to be very high because we want good outlier detection and like keep our uh, in, in distribution uh, detection also good. And the PC doesn't do a good job here um, over all of the thresholds. If we now include TDI into the equation, uh, we can see that we remarkably improve the out of distribution detection um, and find a way better, we can find a better balance um, with a certain threshold between having good in distribution and out of distribution detection. Um, so speaking about balance, this is just another view of the same data now. Um, we plot on the y-axis the precision difference between in distribution and out of distribution. Um, and we see that if we look at only the PC, so the dashed line, um, there's this best, um, the best value very close to zero, which is quite odd. And then it only gets worse if you compare um, the precision on in-distribution and out-of-distribution. Um, and for if we now include TDI, we uh, see that we can find good balance between being good at um, in-distribution data and also out-of-distribution out of data. And now measuring the area on the curve here, we see that um, with TDI, we uh, get uh, performance improvements of a factor of more than two. We also run the same experiments um, just to double check with uh, MCD. Um, we see that MCD is slightly better than TDI here, but keep in mind that MCD here performs 100 um, repeated forward inference passes and TDI only needs a, very, a single pass. So this is like really good. Um, okay, we'll skip this one. Um, next experiment was data corruptions and MNIST is wrong. Sorry, this is supposed to be SVHN. So the data set Fabrizio showed on the first slide. Um, we evaluated the um, predictive entropy and also accuracy on um, multiple severities of corruption. So here we have brightness. Um, I think zero is like no corruption. And then um, one, two, three, four, five is an in increase in corruption. Um, the PC does not recognize um, like higher predictive entropy with increasing corruption. So the PC is in the blue curve here. And um, when we introduce TDI, we keep the accuracy. So the, the predictive accuracy stays the same, uh, stays the same um, but we now can detect these, uh, these distribution shifts. Um, in the paper, we evaluate this for 15 other corruptions, for example, Gaussian noise, short noise, and so on. And we see um, the same over all the corruptions um, that TDI can detect the distribution shifts and is also more robust in predictive accuracy against the corruption. Okay, so for future work, um, what do we want to do? Right now, we have not yet investigated the influence of the dropout parameter. So keep in mind, we have these dropout um, random variables and dropout needs this parameter P. Um, we set it to, I think, 0 0.2 or 0 0.3 in the experiments, but we actually need to investigate, like what's the influence? Can we maybe learn this parameter and so on? Um, the next thing is, can we generalize to arbitrary PC structures? I mean, right now it works for, um, for all structures, but we need to find these um, solutions for the covariance, right? Um, and maybe the, like there's a solution that um, is not an approximation for all of uh, for all of the structures or for arbitrary structures that would be cool. Um, maybe you've noted uh, noticed that our experiments are in the discriminative setting, and PCs are actually also density estimators. Um, we have preliminary results on density estimation as well, but most of them were a bit surprising, and we need more investigation there. Um, and lastly, what is also super interesting for us is, can we use the uncertainty signal here from TDI um, during the training? So can we train a PC and during training show out of distribution data or corrupted data and so on, and uh, like enforce the PC to have high uncertainty on corrupted data or out of distribution data, and with this even make the PC more robust. Um, so to conclude and summarize, we have shown that PCs can be over, over, uh, overconfident. Um, we introduce a tractable dropout inference to tackle this. Um, it's an MCD inspired solution, uh, which offers straightforward single pass uncertainty estimation in PCs um, that enhances the PC robustness. It removes the computational burden of MCD. 
um, and it paves the way to include uncertainty into PC training uh, with the with the um, uh, with the uh, um, signal and also allows to include prior knowledge of epistemic or aleatoric uncertainty. Yeah, thanks for your attention. And now we are ready for the discussant. Hmm. Hey there. Let's skip those slides. Yeah. Let's just back up. All this? Yeah, good. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Skip and let's just back up. Mm. Okay. Okay. Uh, okay. So I would like to invite the discussant, uh, Sebastian Chaichek. Hello. Hey, can you hear me? Yes. All right. So thanks for the excellent presentation. Maybe you can just go to my next slide. So my name is Sebastian Chiacek. I'm from the University of Vienna, and I'm very happy to share some thoughts about the paper. Let me start with a summary of key takeaways. So I guess the first thing was that um, in contrast, apparently, to a common belief that probabilistic circuits are kind of not sensitive to out-of-distribution data, we have seen some experiments that they can actually be overconfident on out-of-distribution data. Um, so they had several experiments demonstrating that. I guess the second key point is that this over uh, overconfidence can be alleviated by accounting for model uncertainty. And like in this paper, this is done by applying Monte Carlo dropout to probabilistic circuits. And because PCs have quite a nice tractable structure, um, they can actually compute kind of a closed form solution to the Monte Carlo dropout, which they call tractable dropout inference or TDI for short. And TDI performs essentially, I guess, variance propagation through the probabilistic circuit. At, and because of the closed form is actually very efficient. And I guess then the third thing is in experiments, the authors have really demonstrated that DDI can achieve good performance, which is very nice on this out of distribution data. So in particular, we have seen experiments where we have seen improved performance for detecting out of distribution data. And we've also seen partly, and I think there's more in the paper, that um, TDI can make these models more robust, for instance, to certain aspects of um, data corruption. Maybe now to some questions, and I think some of them we have all heard about. One question is about some results in the paper. So in particular, I was wondering why applying TDI performs systematically worse than Monte Carlo dropout. So there's one table where a bunch of methods is compared and there are, uh, yeah, TDI performs worse than Monte Carlo dropout. And I would be curious to understand why this is. Looking at the code, and I think this was also hinted at in future work, it didn't become clear to me how dropout was used during training. So I think Monte Carlo dropout was used. And, and if so, might this explain the gap? And of course then, but I guess the authors already said that, is there a way to train using TDI or exploit that in some, some form? Then a second aspect I would be interested to understand, and maybe the authors have investigated this a little bit. Um, so what happens if we need to make approximations to perform TDI, right? So in certain cases, TDI can be quadratic, I guess, in the number of like childs of a sum node. And of course, this could be prohibitive. And like they also have apparently discussed this and thought about this. Um, but did you also run experiments to kind of demonstrate what's happened? Along these lines, um, it would be interesting to understand whether can you do more like using TDI, right? So for instance, there are all these papers which try to learn the dropout rate, right? To get kind of better estimates of uncertainty and so on. And I guess you can apply all these things also for um, TDI and probabilistic circuits. And it would be interesting to understand this. And then just very quickly, uh, a last concern, and maybe the authors already hinted at that, but when reading the paper, I wasn't really convinced that predictive entropy is a very good way of detecting outliers. I think there's also a brief comment in that regard in the paper. Um, but to me, it was really quite unclear why predictive entropy and thresholds on that should be sensible measures for outlier detection, right? Because you can easily think of examples where a good mod model should actually generalize, right? And also have low predictive entropy on new samples. But I guess it would be rather about the class conditional likelihoods, which you would want to change. And that said, I guess like maybe in future work, it would be under, uh, interesting to understand a little bit better uh, or perform a more fine-grained analysis of the out of distribution performance of, of TDI in probabilistic circuits. But really great work. Um, thanks a lot.
Yeah, thanks for the uh, for the summary and the great questions. Um, I'll just start with the first one. Um, just interrupt me if you have another yeah. idea. Um, so why does TDI perform systematically worse than MCD? So, I mean, yes, it does perform worse, which, we, which we've also shown on the slides, um, because in TDI, we need to do approximations. So for the covariance, for example, then there's also one more uh, approximation that we like didn't went into detail here, uh, which is about base formula when we want to do predictions and so on. Um, so right now, this is not exact in, in, in general, um, and MCD um, probably then gets closer to the true uh, uncertainty, whatever the true uncertainty is. So MCD, if you like have the compute, is probably still a bit better measurement, but um, then TDI is tractable, it just needs a single forward pass. Um, how was dropout performed during training? Yeah, just as dropout in neural networks, um, yeah. You randomly sample uh, the the um, dropout value, so either drop that part of the graph or not. If that answers your question, um, then the complexity of TDI can be quadratic. Uh, yes, but just not quadratic in general, but like locally subquadratic um, with respect to the number of um, inputs at some nodes. Uh, which like it's not quadratic with with spec, respect to like the whole PC size, but just the number of inputs, which is way way smaller than the whole PC size. Um, and what effect would approximately uh, like a solution have in terms of performance? Um, well, if you, the more you approximate, uh, like if you, for example, say use the copy paste uh, solution, then your approximation gets worse because you then ignore the covariances um, and you're far f further off from the true uncertainty. Again, whatever the true uncertainty is here. Um, then for the last question, measuring or out of distribution performance. Yeah, so that is actually interesting. And as you said, we should probably further investigate there. We have not done anything on generalization uh, yet. All right, thank you. Thank you. Um, okay, let's see if there are any other questions. No? Okay, let's thank the speaker. Okay, this concludes the session. Thank you for coming. And and we have coffee. Spotlights. Ah, okay. Spotlights.